Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Letty Cotton Pogrebin has worn many hats, co-founder of Ms. Magazine, social activist, lecturer, author of 11 books, and now her second novel, Single Jewish Male Seeking Soulmate, has just been published by the Feminist Press. It weaves theology, history, survivor's guilt, sociology, and the complexities of intimate relationships between Jews and non-Jews into an interesting read. And it raises some fundamental questions about what constitutes Jewishness and what constitutes family. Her reasons for writing this particular story and the conclusion she comes to are what we'll discuss with her today. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be back. So your novel tells the story of Zachariah Levy, a liberal Jewish New York lawyer and the son of Holocaust survivors, and the moral dilemma he faces when he falls in love with an African-American woman who then discovers she's pregnant. Why did you decide to write this story? Well, it, actually, its first seed was years ago when one of my daughters fell in love with a Catholic boy, and I suddenly was blindsided by this feeling, uh-oh, I lost a third of my family in the Holocaust, and now my grandchildren might not be Jewish. You know, what was it all for? What do I owe these people? Uh, how much of my heritage do I actually uh, understand and am I able to transmit? When I say I want Jewish grandchildren, does that mean I've given my daughters and son uh, an opportunity to understand what it is their heritage is all about? And mm -hmm. I started to question my initial reaction, which was one of resistance. Uh, eventually she did um, date other people and married a Jew from Skokie, Illinois, but um, it opened my mind to the fact that we as Jews automatically feel uh, inclined to stay within our group. Uh, and largely, not because, in my view, not because of anti-other uh, or racism or uh, anti-Christian attitudes, but because we feel this obligation to carry forward a heritage that has been so threatened. Mm -hmm. So that's part of what brought Zach and uh, Cleo together, uh, because Cleo kind of contains that otherness for a Jew, but she carries her own heritage. She has her own legacy to protect. And I wanted to surface that because I was in a black Jewish dialogue group for 10 years, and I had an opportunity to really know the other as a friend. I, I felt as if I could see the world through my black sister's eyes. And so in creating her character, it was an amalgam of the women I worked with in this group and came to know intimately in this group for 10 years. Do you find, um, I, you talk about your experience, do a lot of Jews, male and female, feel the same way you feel about uh, having this mandate to um, marry within the community and raise Jewish children. I mean, a lot of it comes out of the Holocaust, yes, right? Yes, it does. And it does, do. certainly in, in my initial response, that was the origin of it that fueled it. Um, you know, it's a generational thing. Uh, I think my generation is still carrying this, this Holocaust mentality forward. But in our community, more than half of uh, all young Jews marry other than mm -hmm. Jewish, Jewish partners. Mm -hmm. So obviously it's not uh, a motivating force for the next generation. Right. And that raises a lot of issues I talk about in Single Jewish Male Seeking Soulmate, which is, what is it going to mean to be Jewish in the future? If uh, in bringing together two traditions, how do you raise the children? And if you're the Jewish partner, how much do you know about your heritage that you can actually educate your right, child in? Right. Or are you and, just saying, you know, I want to marry one of my own, but I really don't know what my religion or my heritage right. is all about? And you mentioned that a lot of these Jews who feel this compulsion to um, create more Jews to replace those who were lost in the, in the Holocaust and make sure that Jews are going to survive, uh, survive uh, are not necessarily observant Jews. That's the irony. And Zach, in the, the character in this novel, is emotionally Jewish and culturally Jewish, but he doesn't have a grounding. You know, he finished his education after his bar mitzvah, which is typical. You know, kids get bar mitzvah and that's it. They don't want to go to Hebrew school. They don't want to go to Hebrew high school. They're done which is uh, one of the challenges to the Jewish communal, communal leadership is why, why don't kids want to stay in the fold? Why don't mm -hmm. they want to continue their education? Why haven't we lit a fire under them that right. makes them 
want to know more about their faith tradition. Right. I have to point out that um, middle class African Americans don't want their children marrying outside of the race either. Exactly what you know, I, I... And I was mm -hmm. trying to think about the reason for that. We don't have a Holocaust reason. Um, and I don't know if it's necessarily about perpetuating the race, but I think it's like, um, aren't blacks good enough for you to want to marry one? I mean, you know, isn't, you know, to, to a son, isn't a black a female good enough for you to marry mm -hmm. isn't a uh, black male good enough for you to marry something something like that that's a fascinating uh, uh, extra dimension mm -hmm. um, uh, in this book Cleo is the heir to the black church of the south her father was a, a pastor he was also a, a, a civil rights activist as was her mother who they took in you know northerners who came down to register voters and uh, they were, you know, sort of shoulder to shoulder with King and uh, John Lewis and that generation. And, you know, she wants somebody who understands that, who carries that baggage proudly, you know, that struggle. And who also comes with a consciousness that a, a non-African American simply does not have right. as he or she moves through the world. So one of the things about uh, Cleo that I could never have written if I hadn't been in this black Jewish dialogue is that she collects uh, artifacts of um, the Jim, Jim, Crow, Jim days. Crow days. Right. And he's shocked because he's a civil liberties lawyer and he can't bear the sight of these things which are displayed like museum pieces in her living room. And she said, I need to have around me these reminders that we didn't just, you know, survive slavery 150 years ago. This was just 10 years ago, 20 right. years ago, where I come from. And that's, you know, Piccaninny dolls and Mammy cookie jars and colored only uh, uh, signs on water fountains. Little black jockeys. Uh, yeah, little black jockeys <laughs> on the 21 club steps. Right, and yeah. they, they painted them white after protest. <laughs> yeah, well, so, I mean, she, she inherits that okay. consciousness. And Zach isn't going to bring that consciousness in. In fact, he's a, uncomfortable. He's a classic right. liberal. Right. He's uncomfortable with this, and she's, like, facing it head on. It has seemed to be over the years, at least for a long time, that most of the interracial marriages involving African Americans that I knew about involved African Americans and Jews. It, yeah. it always seemed to be African Americans <laughs> and Jews. I have no statistics on this, and that might actually be changing because I see at least more, more African-American men marrying Asians and Latinos than you used to have. But there's always been a kind of connection between yes. blacks and Jews. Yes. In fact, um, the idea of there being blacks, whites, and Jews is a kind of common um, assumption, as if Jews are a third race, because we weren't we didn't count ourselves among the privileged. We didn't even notice our white skin privilege because we felt, you know, we, we couldn't get into the good schools, we couldn't get jobs in the banks or in the big institutions. And we felt like an out group and we bonded with another out group to change uh, institutions and the world. Right. So we never felt really white until recently when Jews have privilege and economic security and all of that. And that has created a division in what used to be, at least from the Jewish perspective, uh, an alliance. Right, because I, and I was just about to, to make the point that relationships between blacks and Jews in this country has been fraught, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in recent decades. You know, on, on the one hand, there were partners in the struggle. On the other hand, I guess it was sort of like familiarity breeds contempt. <laughs> if you look at Ocean Hill, Brownsville, and Crown Heights, right. Um, a sense of not quite trusting each other. Uh, I remember the, you know, the whole Jesse Jackson, Jaime Town business and Louis Farrakhan was perceived as being uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, American blacks uh, splitting with Jews over uh, the Israeli-Palestinian thing, blacks tending and to Andy be sympathetic to, to Palestinians, right. Uh, and the seems never ending debate over who has suffered the most. It's it. Uh, was Jews during the Holocaust right. or blacks during slavery? Yes, right. Yes, it's a competition of tears, and then it's a kind of, you know, lining up the statistics of suffering and agony and loss and death against, you know, the statistics in the other person's uh, history. But 
that's a talk about it, a divide and conquer um, strategy. That certainly works because if we're not working together, um, you know, if we're only protecting our own, we know we know what happens. That that weakens us. That weakens mm -hmm. each side. Um, so I I sent this novel in exactly the period when all of that kind of hit the fan, and that's the Jesse Jackson used the word Town. Jews said you would not a tolerated Jew who called New York Coontown. Um, Jackson said, oh no, it's just street, street slang, slang. And Jews said, it seems to be revealing something deeper. And Jews said, we're going to put an ad in the New York Times full page ad, Jews against Jackson. Now that was the first time there was a kind of in your face, we're not with you state right. from the Jewish world, right. which had always coalesced with, you know, a hundred black men and American Jewish Committee and the women's counterparts of those groups. And suddenly it was, wait a minute, if you can't get behind Jesse Jackson with, you know, we've been together through this struggle, then the heck with you. Um, the Farrakhan thing felt more threatening to Jews because uh, Farrakhan was an outright anti, anti spokesperson for an anti-Semitic perspective. Um, and, uh, you know, blacks had a good answer. And they said, he's telling our kids to stay in school. He wears a white shirt and a bow tie. And, you know, he has an alarm clock. He gets up for work in the morning. We want a model like this. Right. We don't just want, you know, a rapper or a, an athlete as a model for our black males. So we had to understand that. We had to see the world through uh, the eyes of African Americans, who we used to have a feeling of a kind of knee-jerk, automatic um, empathy with. Yeah, empathy right. with. You know, I've seen a lot of um, Jewish women and Jewish couples who have adopted Asian children, and so I have to ask: if um, Zach had fallen in love with an Asian woman instead of a black woman, do you think he would have felt as conflicted about marrying her or having a child with her? I think he would have because his agony was, and his anguish was, I made a promise to my mother. I made the promise I would marry a Jew and raise Jewish children when I was 13, the eve of his bar mitzvah, and again on her deathbed. Carrying a promise that heavy and weighty uh, would apply to anybody, anybody who's not willing to raise the children Jewish. Mm -hmm. If he met an Asian who said, look, I'm not wedded to my faith, whatever you feel, let's do. But he knew with Cleo, he, he was dealing with somebody who had just as strong compulsions to honor her past. And that was going to be a struggle that would be in direct conflict with his promise. Mm -hmm. um, you grew up in a conservative Jewish family, went to Jewish schools, went to, you know, Brandeis, uh, mm -hmm. which has a, a strong Jewish connection. Were, were, were you under pressure to find and marry a nice Jewish boy? Well, my mother died when I was 15, and my father pretty much didn't care. So okay. Even though he was a practicing Jew and a very serious Talmudist and a, a president of the synagogue, he never, he never gave me that message. And I grew up with a totally, you know, we used to call tolerant attitude, which is a, a condescending to my ear now, but an open-minded, completely mm -hmm. open-minded attitude. And I told you before we started this program that I ended up going to Brandeis and only dated non-Jews. Don't know how that happened, except I gravita gravitated toward the athletes and they tended to not be Jewish. Um, I don't think that I had any uh, suspicion that my own reaction would be so strong until it happened mm -hmm. with my daughter. Mm -hmm. okay. I had no sense of myself carrying this a tremendous tradition and, and inheritance until it was suddenly threatened. Right. That's interesting. I was talking to an African-American woman, the other, a friend of mine. She does not have children, but she said, you know, if I had uh, a son and he talked about marrying a white woman, I said, that would not happen. <laughs> she said, that would not happen. Now, maybe I'd let my daughter marry a white guy because there are not so many black guys around, but, you know, my but, son would not marry a white woman, she said. Well, that touches on something that I'm, I'm sure you've noticed, which is when there is interracial marriage, it's most often a, a black man marrying a white woman. Right. And so when you said, aren't we good enough, that really resonated for me through the Black Jewish Dialogue Group and what I heard there. And that is, you know, why wouldn't you choose one of us? Why do you have to go white? Is it to, uh, in some way, accumulate power through the white skin privilege mm -hmm. of the person you marry? Right. Uh, or is it that you have a self-loathing that gets somehow or other sloughed off if a white woman has chosen you? Right.
Right. And it gets so naughty and so complicated. It when is you complicated. add race to gender to religion, right. oh my God, it's such it's right. explosive. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with more with Letty Cotton Pogerbin after this message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Letty Cotton Pogerbin, whose latest book, Single Jewish Male Seeking Soulmate, has just been published by the Feminist Press. So, in the book, uh, Zach and Cleo meet. They have an instant attraction for one another. They appear to be soulmates. But he tells her early on that because of this promise he's made to his mother, he can never marry a, a non-Jew, and she accepts that. Now, if I were she, I think I would have found that insulting and would have broken off the relationship right then and there. I mean, he comes off as, as something of a jerk. Do you, do, do you think he is? I think he's, um, he's burdened, and he's honest. I, I see it the other way, because he could have just jollied it along, saying, well, you know, this isn't going to last, but... I don't have to present my reasons. I just have to get into this relationship and it'll run its course. Instead, he, he anticipates that this is going to be a very meaningful connection and he doesn't want to mislead her. So he tells her the truth and she gets the, the depths of that truth. And that's why she sticks it out. I mean, later on, she's a talk show host, so you can relate to her. Later on, she does a program about the talented 10th. Uh, supposedly, was it Du Bois said, there's a talented tenth of one in ten uh, African-American men who are really kind of royalty, intellectual uh, royalty. And she said, where are they? I'm not finding them. So, and she does a program with women who are similarly afflicted with this paucity of uh, a pool of men to choose from. And maybe she just kind of opts in because it's a fun relationship. They have a lot in common. They laugh a lot. Um, they met at a, J a black Jewish dialogue meeting. So they understand where they're coming from. They crossed swords at that meeting. They really did make sparks of all kinds, both romantic and ideological. So she knows what she's getting into. Okay. So the crisis comes when uh, Cleo unintentionally becomes pregnant. Um, I mean, it was, a, it was not intended. Zach breaks off their relationship immediately, uh, and they have a signed agreement that uh, he will support her child um, financially, provided that he never meets the child, never knows the child's name or gender. Um, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it may sound very transactional, but when you see the alternative, which is how many men just split. And don't support, and don't right, support right, 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 right. So he's trying, again, he's, he's trying, trying to, to do the right honorable. thing. He's he trying thinks. to do the right thing. He's caught in the crosshairs of this, the promise versus the love that he feels for this woman. And she's a fabulous woman. And, you know, under other circumstances, there would be no question that this is the woman for him. He has to filter his love through a screen, a screen that says Jew, non-Jew. And that hobbles him. That cripples him. And anybody who's saying, I have to first make sure I'm marrying this kind of person, is hobbled by that. Mm -hmm. Whether it's race or class or education or whatever, you know, I have to marry somebody with a college degree. Well, what if you fall in love with, you know, somebody who's a working class person, right. but a fabulous person? You have to kind of get past that screen. Right to allow yourself to love. So, so Zach, uh, by the way, Zach does have an ex-wife who is Jewish. is Jewish and a daughter who's being raised Jewish, mm -hmm. so I have to say that. So after Zach uh, breaks up with Cleo and says, okay, now I've got to go find myself a Jewish wife. I'm yeah. going to right. definitely search for a second Jewish wife. And <laughs> you notice, you, you note that he is wildly in demand on the Jewish marriage, <laughs> marriage market. I would, <laughs> this must be something that you've seen a lot. Well, I do say that he goes to a friend's Seder, and he's more welcome at the Seder table than the prophet Elijah. Right. <laughs> whose cup we put on the table when we open the door for Elijah to come in. Mm -hmm. A single Jewish man is more welcome than the prophet. <laughs> right, right. Uh, I have a friend who is 
she's sort of Jewish. <laughs> she says, you know, you know, they, they, they say Jewish men make great husbands. If they make such great husbands, why are so many of them divorced? But that's yeah. her story. <laughs> After having a lot of bad dates and, and, one, and one night stands, Zach meets Babka, mm -hmm. a Jewish woman, a comic, rather bohemian person. Um, uh, she's sometimes irritating. She drinks, she smokes, she's a bit dishonest. We think she stole some money from his wallet. Um, of all the Jewish women you could have paired with Zach, why her? Well, because the interesting thing about Babka is she's got all the credentials. She, she's a child of Holocaust parents. She went to a yeshiva. I went to a yeshiva for two years, the yeshiva of Central Queens, so I know that scene. Uh, but, you know, so she passes through that screen in fact, she passes through with flying colors. She knows all the prayers. She knows her Hebrew is better than Zach's. She's fully credentialed, but she's a loony. So though they have a very fiery relationship and it's fun to read about, she's a performance artist and she's funny, um, it kind of raises the whole profile of what are you really looking for when you say you need to find, you know, Jewish male seeking soulmate, and he's assuming that soulmate has to be a Jew. Here he's got a Jew who's got all the same training and background he has, and she's miles from his soulmate. Mm -hmm. But it takes him a long time to realize that, just as it takes all of us a long time to realize that um, the arenas in which we make our initial judgments are flawed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so Zach and Barbara break up, you know, Bobka. he decides, Bobka, I'm sorry, yeah. what did I call her? Yeah, Barbara. Barbara, That's Bobka, name. Bobka. Right. Um, and Cleo, who he's had no contact with for three years, uh, suddenly, unexpectedly contacts him because their son, Terrell, has been asking about who's, who is his father. Um, so she gives Zach the option of, decide, of of meeting the boy and deciding, having met him whether he wants to be in the boy's life or not. And that becomes a big question of the novel. Yeah. What will Zach choose to do? Can he be true to his people and true to himself? Um, do you know people who've agonized over this issue as much as Zach does? Many. Really? Uh-huh. Many, many, many. Too, too many um, for the good of the future of the Jewish people in the sense that, you know, we haven't gotten over, we still haven't gotten over our... Um, our Holocaust mentality. Um, for Zach, it's uh, the fact that he agrees to meet this child is a triumph of the human in him. Uh, he's opening himself. I don't want to give away the whole plot, but he opens himself up to falling in love with his own child, somebody who he had uh, pr proscribed her from ever telling him who the child was, even the gender, the name. Um, he was supposed to steer clear of her because she's so magnetic to him. Mm -hmm. And he says yes. So that, the arc of the novel now takes a real kind of leap into what is he thinking? When he sees this child, he goes to the 67th Street Adventure Playground in Central Park. Is he going to identify himself to the child? If so, in what way? How is he going to spend this period of time she's allotted for him to get to know the child? And then what is his reasoning process? Here he has, you know, a son. He has a daughter from his Jewish wife. Here he has a son. And a son would carry his father's name. And his father mothered him because his mother was really uh, impaired by the Holocaust experience. She was traumatized. So again, it raises the issue of inherited trauma and how it plays out in the present. Um, now, your daughter did not marry no, a non-Jewish uh, person. But what are your feelings about marriages between Jews and non-Jews? Um, I'm not going to say how this book ends, but I'm going to say I play out all my feelings in, in Zach's uh, reasoning process, the, lo the logic of it, the uh, confusion, the complexity. He goes to um, three different experts to right. kind of air his um, his questions and to... Um, dress rehearse the reasoning. And one of them says, uh, and I, I was trying to find it again this morning, it says, toss a coin. What was, what was that about? Yeah, that was the, the advice he got from a, a, a teacher at Hebrew Union College, a reform institution, a very, very wise professor, kind of 
bohemian peacenik professor who uh, was just trying to run him through the whole issue of patrilineal descent, which in Judaism is a new concept relatively. Matrilineal descent, that is, you count your Jewishness through From the mother. mother. Right. And the reform movement issued a, a, a proclamation a few years back that, no, you can have just a male parent and still be a Jew as long as you, as you do certain practices that mark you as a Jew. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, counterintuitively, this professor said, well, somebody I know who has studied this issue very closely said, if you're going to try to r raise a child in both traditions, you're better off flipping a coin and just saying whichever tradition Choosing comes one. up, you pick it. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise you are bequeathing to your child the confusion you haven't been able to solve yourself. And that's an unfair legacy to give a kid. Just because you guys can't settle on one way, uh, don't say to the child, you, here, we're going to give you two and you pick. Mm. But I know people who have managed somehow or other to do Christmas and Hanukkah, Easter and Passover. Jesus is the Messiah. No, we're waiting for the Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that works, but it works That's for some be people. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. What do you want to be the message of the book? Um, I want the message of the book to be to, to honor um, one's history and legacy, but not let it dictate. Uh, one's life. I think that uh, the overarching theme here is should love trump tradition and history and peoplehood and heritage or should or do we have to carry forward everything that's come down to us from our ancestors and I want people to think about that in new ways. I don't have a conclusion myself you'll have to someone will have to read the book to see how Zach figures this out. But I think it, it, it merits being raised to the level of consciousness and disputation and discussion in people's lives before they take a leap. The thing I hear about most often is people who marry interfaith, interracially, but interfaith, and don't, don't figure it out in advance. Mm. They just say, well, you know, we'll, we'll do it when the time comes, we'll right. figure it out. And things get extremely messy and naughty if they haven't talked So maybe it's a good idea to yeah. figure it out ahead of time. Yeah, exactly. Very interesting, very interesting story. We're out of time. I want to thank Letty Cotton Pogerbin for joining me today. Single Jewish Male Seeking Soulmate has just been published by the Feminist Press for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy. If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.